Welcome everyone. I'm Angelo Robles. I'm the founder of the Angelo Robles podcast on Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and Stitcher. And boy, I guess I might have messed that up a little bit because that sounds weird to say you're the founder of a podcast, the host of. How about that? That's much better. Uh, but I am the founder and CEO of Family Office Association, a global membership organization dedicated to families of great wealth and their family offices. I'm incredibly excited about today's interview. And to give you context of the times, it is early September. So we have so much going on around the world with COVID and here in the US with the upcoming election and really a topic that I'm incredibly engaged by. Uh, so we're titling it, Sir Ronald Cohen, Impact, Reshaping Capitalism to Drive Real Change. Our special guest today is Sir Ronald Cohen. Uh, those of you do know, before we got on, he said it's okay and preferred to call him Ronnie, so I'm not being disrespectful, uh, but I will honor his request as we begin. Let me give you a little background first. He's an amazing pioneering philanthropist, venture capitalist, private equity investor, and social innovator who is driving forward the global impact revolution. He serves as chairman of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment, and the Portland Trust. He is co-founder of Social Finance UK, USA, and Israel, co-founder, chair of the Bridges Fund Management, and former founding chair, Big Society Capital. He graduated from Oxford University and holds an MBA from Harvard Business School. He is the recent author, and that's where I got my title from, Impact, Reshaping Capitalism, to drive real change. And as a little bit of a side note, because he's gonna to be too modest, uh, he has been described as the father of British venture capital and the father of social investment. It is a great honor. Sir Ronald Cohen, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you very much, Angelo. Nice to be here with you. Thank you. I am gonna read a brief quote of yours and I would like to understand the context of what it means to you. The quote is, we are moving towards a better and fairer world where markets drive doing good while making profit and people want to do good and do well at the same time. In concluding, we must embrace measurable impact as a driver in every investment, business and policy decision we make. This is the invisible heart of the markets guiding their invisible hand. Very eloquent, what do you mean? So I mean, um, Angelo, that if you look today at investment flows, uh, 30 to $40 trillion a year is flowing to environmental, social, and governance investment. Now that's equivalent to a third and a half, between a third and a half of all professionally managed assets. It's not a coincidence uh, that this is happening that investors are looking for impact as well as profit. We've seen over the last decade, and perhaps beginning even before that, the values of a younger generation change. Young consumers do not want to buy the products of companies that are polluting our atmosphere or creating social issues, like using child labor, for example. And they don't want to work for those companies either. And so we have a change of values, which started with consumers and employees and young entrepreneurs, has translated itself into a major change in our investment flows, and now begins to confront the question of how do we improve our system? So there's pressure now because of COVID, because of all the social inequality and the eruption into violence that it has caused prior to COVID and during uh, COVID, not just in the United States, but in France, in Chile, in, in, in the Lebanon, uh, which also resulted in, in the referendum result 
of uh, Brexit. We have seen these things happen before our eyes. And we're at a juncture now where technology and big data enable us to measure the impact of companies just as we measure their profit. And that, in my view, will be a milestone in the evolution of our financial system. And I'm going in the direction of the title of your book in reshaping capitalism to drive real change. You obviously are a highly successful capitalist uh, here in America. It's a highly capitalistic country. Uh, it's not perfect, but it appears to be <laughs> the way, at least that we would believe that it works. But of course, things need to evolve. What does capitalism mean to you? Capitalism for me meant a economies driven by profit, where the incentive for individuals and for companies is to make as much money as possible, where success is defined by the amount of money that you make. That for me is capitalism. And so you look at other forms of political structures, if I could use that word, obviously there's gonna be many, but probably the ones that people are gonna be most familiar with are capitalism, socialism, and communism. Uh, so socialism to me, and it may mean different things to different people, is likely still a quote unquote, somewhat of a capitalistic system, but it does tax, if that would be the proper word, and redistribute wealth to those that may be more challenged to give them, quote unquote, greater opportunity. Some would call that government confiscation, but let's be a little kind, we'll call that socialism. And communism, of course, is where uh, the state or the government applicably uh, has a monopoly on various goods and services and supposedly supports, quote unquote, others. Uh, not what we would be used to here in America. And I would say even that verbiage in China, although for sure a communistic government, but obviously has allowed entrepreneurship and a lot of capitalistic like growth in the last couple of decades. I, I'm not gonna ask you to say what's better of one than the other or what are the weaknesses, but how do they interact in a globe where the world is more, it's, we're, we're all coming together and we're all challenged by COVID-19. How could we work together? So the aim is to use markets and flows of capital and entrepreneurship, but to get ourselves out of the deep hole we've dug for ourselves, Angela. A hole where companies make as much money as they can and negligently create huge damage environmentally and socially. And then governments tax us all to try to remedy them. That is a self-defeating system. And the question we all face is, well, how can we change the system so that we stop polluting and creating social issues while we provide growth and profitability to power a general improvement through prosperity of our society? And for hundreds of years, we've had the system of just focusing on profit. But today in the 21st century, technology and big data enable us to look as transparently at the impact which companies create as we do of the profit they make. And so we have the opportunity today to measure alongside the profit, the environmental damage and the social damage that companies create through their products, through their employment, and through their operations. And if we can provide that transparency to investors, then we're going to find a new type of world, a world where investors pick companies that know how to make money and improve lives and the environment, where the value of companies quoted on our different stock markets falls if they are performing less well on impact as well as profit. And so there is a mechanism now to change the incentives which our capitalist system provides. That's why I call it impact capitalism. Now, 
will governments inevitably have to redistribute income and wealth? I think the answer is yes. It's just a question of the extent to which they do so. When you get glaring inequality, if it's glaring enough, you get revolutions. You're getting rebellion in the street. It threatens the lives of citizens, the cohesion of our societies, and our own prosperity. And so it behoves us now, coming out of COVID, which has shaken our habits and beliefs and led to a lot of questioning of capitalism, of democracy, and so on, to seize this opportunity to take what is powerful about markets and capital and to put by its side impact, the measurement of the effect on people's lives and planet alongside profit. And I believe that that is where the world is heading. That's what the 30 to $40 trillion of ESG investment is signaling um, to us. And I believe that we need to do it out of necessity because it's the only way we're going to be able to meet the environmental and social challenges we face. Very well said. A couple of months back, we had on Jeremy Grantham, who discussed climate change very passionately and very eloquently and echoing some of the things that you just noted there. I guess the question I would have is, to some degree, who's to blame? Meaning Wall Street, and I'm using that word broadly, Wall Street judges these public companies by their quarterly profitability. It encourages the board and the CEO to be focused on short-term profits to maximize their bonuses and profitability, to look good and to keep on having a job. How do we change that? So in order to change it, you have to change the system. You can't fiddle around with regulation within a system that is driven solely by profit. We've heard changes in values being expressed by the biggest business leaders. Uh, the Business Roundtable, a very conservative body of leading corporations in the United States, came out almost exactly a year ago, as you know, with a statement that we can no longer worry about shareholder capitalism. We have to move to stakeholder capitalism. It's not just shareholders, it's employees, it's the community, it's the environment. And so the way to change it, in my view, is to get companies to report on their impact with audited numbers alongside the profit numbers that they publish and to use those numbers to come out with a new set of accounts alongside the traditional ones. Eventually they will replace them, but for some years, perhaps or some decades, uh, we will see two sets of accounts. We will see normal profit and loss accounts and balance sheets, and then we will see impact weighted profit and loss accounts and balance sheets. There are already over 50 companies across the world practicing some form of impact accounting. It started in Europe uh, rather than in the United States this time. But in a way, the US led the whole world to generally accepted accounting principles in 1933 in the depths of the Great Depression because investors realized after the great crash, Angelo, as you well know, that they didn't have transparency on the profit that companies were making. Companies picked their own accounting policies and there were no auditors to verify the numbers. And people remonstrated in Congress that this would spell the end of American capitalism. You know as well as I do, that the breadth and depth of our financial markets across the world depend on the transparency and the reliability and dependability of our accounting system. Today, we see a third to a half of all investment trying to achieve impact as well as profit with no transparency on the impact being created. And so we're at a similar crossroad. 
And the question is, will the United States lead in providing this transparency? And if it doesn't, will it be Europe or will it be Asia or will it be individual countries across the world? But I believe we will inevitably have to go there. And taking on a point that you said earlier in terms of the younger generation, people in their 20s and 30s, older generation Z and millennial, and I see this in single family offices when they spearhead or take more uh, responsibility, they do have a different focus in their belief system often and investing. Uh, very simply, do you think as people in their 20s and 30s rise to position of greater seniority and C-level positions in company, it's going to be easier for them to incorporate what's going to be their generation's values and interest. And we're probably on the cusp of that now, but there are a lot of people that are more my age or older where they're going to need to be forced to. Is it inevitable that this will happen organically, but is that going to be too slow? A very good question, Angela. The appearance of information now, reliable information, is going to affect the older generation that has been skeptical, just as the younger generation has changed its views. Harvard Business School published on its website, you can all go to see it, under the Impact Weighted Accounts uh, Initiative, the environmental damage caused by 1,800 companies if I said to you, Angelo, as appeared in the Harvard Business Review article three, three or four days ago, which I co-authored, that 15% uh, of these 1,800 companies, 250 companies, deliver more environmental damage measured in dollars than they do profit, Will that affect your view of the company's concerned? If a company causes more damage to the world than it delivers in profit, would you continue to invest in it? And if I say to you that a full third, 32%, nearly a third, should I say, of these companies deliver environmental damage equivalent to 25% of their profit, at 500 companies would see their profit diminished by 25% if you offset it against the profit they make. Won't you be curious to know about which companies they are? Now, what we see, Angela, is of course there are some sectors where pollution is inevitable. Take the oil and gas sector, and I'm not in favor of investing in fossil fuels, but you may well be. If I say to you that ExxonMobil, from its operations alone, delivers $39 billion of damage every year, and that if you compare it with Shell, Shell is delivering $13 billion, and BP is delivering $8 billion, does that affect your decision if you're going to be investing in the oil and gas sector? Similarly with chemical companies. So what you discover when you analyze this data set of 1800 companies is that even within the same sector, the same high pollution sector, there are high performers who have done a better job of reducing their negative impact than their competitors. And so I believe that when we begin to measure impact, everyone will begin to take it into account in making their investment decisions, their employment decisions, their consumption decisions when they're in the supermarket purchasing a particular product. And so this transparency on impact will really transform the way in which our economies generate solutions rather than problems. And you've been an investor since the early 70s. Have you seen a trend lately, and I think the statistics point this out, that companies that practice better ESG, effectively impact investing protocol, 
have done better than those that don't. The old adage was you invest to make a profit and then through your own dollars or philanthropy, you could impact change. But that has shifted with the younger generation not wanting to wait that long or counterbalance their good with their bad they're doing to get to that good. Has it been profitable to invest in companies that are socially aware? So to date this year, BlackRock have shown that uh, ESG investing, environmental, social and govern governance investing has outperformed other forms of investing. But if you look at the Harvard study I was talking, or at least the Harvard data set I was talking about, if you go to the article I co-wrote in the Harvard Business uh, Review, you will see that uh, what you've just said does emerge from the numbers. There is a correlation between high pollution or high environmental damage and lower market valuations. It's appearing already. It's not appearing in every sector, but I believe that with transparency emerging now in all sectors, we will begin to see this correlation emerge. You cannot have half of all money going to avoid pollution and social issues and not affect the values of companies. So some people will do it because they feel morally bound to do it. Some people will do it because they feel it's in their personal interest. But the system will change. And as the system changes, we will redefine profit, value and success. Success will no longer be just how much money we make during our lives. Success will be that and perhaps even more importantly, what contribution we've made to improving other people's lives on the planet. And uh, the reference point of the Harvard Business Review article from Sir Ronald, by the way, it's titled, How to Measure a Company's Real Impact. It is certainly very searchable and it gives multiple reference points. So I'm gonna mention three of them for your commentary. Introduce community investment tax relief. Two, match finance to help set up the first community development venture capital fund, and three, encourage banks to disclose more of their lending activities. What do you think of that? Uh, that is not in the Harvard Business Review article. That must be a different Harvard <laughs> Business Review article you've just read from. Uh, but let me, let me address uh, each uh, of these in turn. Apart from investors beginning to change their investment patterns by shifting away from high pollution, high social cost companies, we are seeing the banks doing the same. Just in, in the last month or two, we've seen five of the major banks in the world saying that they're going to take environmental damage into account when making loans. Now, if you take the whole banking system shifting in that way, which will, will happen because when leading banks begin to do it, others eventually follow. And if you look at investors going in that direction, don't you think it's going to be in inevitable? And now when you raise the question of tax incentives, we've seen in the United States the arrival of opportunity zones. That's a an incentive to improve communities just because uh, you put yourself at one end of the political spectrum or the other doesn't mean that you don't overlap in terms of the uh, goals that we're all trying to, um, to achieve. And using the tax system to provide incentives to strengthen investment in communities is a very sensible thing to do. Now, how does this fit with COVID? I'm sure a lot of our viewers uh, will be asking themselves this question. Governments are going to emerge from COVID with less money to spend because they will have borrowed so much to try to fight it and to fight the unemployment and the slowdown of the economy through stimulus packages. And yet they will be challenged 
by greater social issues than we have perhaps seen since the Great Depression. The level of unemployment will be very high for a number of years. Why? Partly because large companies are streamlining as a result of COVID, and many of the unemployed will not find their old jobs back when the economy picks up again. We're going to have to retrain a large part of our workforce for the new jobs that are available. How are governments going to fund that? They can only fund it by bringing private investors and companies to share some of the burden of bringing solutions. So if we want to tackle the issue of inequality, we have to measure the diversity that companies provide within their workforce. We have to compare it with their competitors, with the demographics around their facilities. And we have to begin to calculate the social cost of not having a diverse workforce by taking the numbers of people missing at every echelon of a company's organization and describing to them the salaries those communities would have earned had they been employed. And so this transparency, which the Harvard Business School data set is providing and which will be supplemented next year with the employment impact and the product impact of, 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 of companies is in my view necessary for us to come out of COVID sooner and with a better system that enables us to meet the challenges ahead. Now, coming back to your previous question, Angela, it doesn't matter whether you're a socialist who's concerned about helping those who are left behind by rising prosperity, or whether you're on the right wing of the political spectrum and what you want is more efficient government spending. If we can shift in the direction of measuring impact, we improve society with an ideology that transcends government partisanship. We can achieve both the improvement of uh, the more vulnerable people in our society's lives and at the same time, expend our national resources more effectively instead of wasting them on remedying damage that has been negligently caused we can begin to direct them to education which is the biggest lever of uh, of social and economic mobility as uh, you know as uh, we all know of course you give so much to digest there uh, but I have to start somewhere. So on the COVID aspect of it, question is, is the world coming together like never before or potentially are we growing more apart? I sometimes change my mind almost daily, but you bring up some interesting points on employment in some ways that we haven't seen since the Great Depression, some industries disappearing or reshaping major cities due to COVID employment and social unrest probably going to be challenged for years and years to come. Some think possibly never really going to recover. And you have the aspect of, like you said, employers realizing they don't need expensive inner city real estate. They could have a more uh, adaptable workforce that is working remotely. And if you look at some of the numbers of some of these companies, it's kind of working. Uh, but this doesn't necessarily help the blue collar worker. And again, there's industries. I drove through New York. I, I don't think 70% plus of the restaurants are going to make it. Winter's going to come, the flu, the second wave. They can't do outdoor seating. Uh, we're sweeping things under the rug that are going to be very, very challenging. Even if we get a vaccine January, February, or March, it'll be at least six months before 70% of the population gets it. This is gonna be with us a long time. Is it inevitable, my question, <laughs> that was my rant. Is it yeah. inevitable, it's very frustrating to me to someone who greatly believes in lower taxes, uh, but are we inevitably heading towards the deficit 
and the challenges of unemployment that we are going to have to raise taxes. But to people that's, that are entrepreneurs that built their companies from nothing, the idea of that socialistic perspective paying more than our fair share or that perception, and I know some of the audience may cringe when I say that, I'm just being honest from my perspective. That's very concerning to me, but I don't know if there's an other way out. So let's deal with the issue of taxation. Let's assume that um, you have the transparency, uh, which uh, the Harvard Business School data set is beginning to reveal uh, on the impact of companies. You can begin to tax those companies directly that are creating damage instead of taxing us all to tackle that. Companies that are polluting our riverways uh, will be taxed directly instead of uh, through the general taxation of all of, of, of the citizens. And so you begin to create a set of new levers for allocating tax revenues in a more intelligent way than we're doing now. You save government expenditure, which is going to remedy ills that can be prevented. And you begin to bring the entrepreneurship and the innovation and the ability of, of big companies to achieve uh, through their products, social and environmental improvement. You begin to bring that to play a productive role, role a more productive role, uh, in our society. Let's take the example of Tesla, Angela. A company like Tesla, which I view as one of the new icons uh, of, uh, of, of impact uh, uh, capitalism, if you, if you like. Uh, Elon Musk and Tesla didn't set out to make more money only by coming out with electric vehicles they set out to do two things. They set out to make more money and to reduce pollution of the environment. And through the actions of one company, they changed the world's automobile industry and created a company which is more highly rated than General Motors in terms of its market valuation. And even if you argue uh, that that valuation is too high, there's no doubt that consumers are more conscious now of the pollution of their vehicles than they were before. There's not going to be any going back to the combustion engine now that we have hybrids and electric vehicles on, you know, on, our, on our roads. So this notion of being able to provide incentives to improve rather than just incentives to make money is a fundamental change from where we are. Now, there have always been people who blended social and environmental and profit uh, motives in their work. There have always been companies and enlightened business leaders who have thought like that. But in the absence of measurement, you can't use the examples that they are setting to become role models and to become incentives for others in their sectors to change. And so I believe that the new frontier now for capitalism is transparency on impact. Will governments now step up to the plate and mandate that? Will they realize early enough that they need that if they're going to come out of the COVID crisis uh, sooner? I don't know, but uh, broadcasts like this one will hopefully create a movement to make governments aware that we all have the right to know. We have the right to know the profit companies are making, and with nearly half of investment going to achieve impact, we have the right to know the impact companies are creating. Yes. I mean, what you mentioned about Elon Musk having done what he's accomplished in 13 years at Tesla is, it, it's incredible. Yes, we could argue the 
market value or the valuation to get there to but to be worth more than a company like Ford, GM, Honda, <laughs> companies that you never would have thought this. It's amazing. And that would be a good analogy that you gave. A little bit on that trend, and you hinted at this earlier, what COVID is also doing is what was going to happen, but take five or 10 years, now is incredibly accelerated. Working from home, the advent of greater VR and augmented reality, of AI, of big data, of technology. And this is both exciting and a more efficient world, but it could be a little scary. I'm not gonna quote him properly, but I'll just say some approximate sentences. Elon Musk noted that what he's noticing now in AI is like, wow, this is even catching him a little off guard, what he has access to and is seeing. And he thinks that in five years, there could be issues with jobs. You probably knew I was eventually gonna trend in this direction. Is it inevitable? And this is very hard for someone like me to swallow, but I think it needs to be explored that we're gonna need to have universal base income. Wow, uh, that's a big question, Angela. Let me first uh, reply to it by saying that it's inevitable that we're going to have to retrain people for new jobs during their careers, perhaps several times, because the pace of technological advance is such that there is a constant shortage of skills uh, for these new highly sophisticated um, uh, industries, and that that exacerbates the inequalities that, uh, that exist already uh, in the world today. In order to reduce these inequalities, we're going to have to be imaginative at using AI to enhance the ability of people who have been trained, but not to the highest level, to use technology to achieve things. Uh, to achieve work, uh, to play roles in, in companies uh, that are enhanced by the technology they have. Now, human progress has moved forward in fits and starts, but there's no doubt that the human progress has improved billions of, of lives. And I have faith that uh, once again, our ingenuity will help us to create new sets of jobs as um, uh, technology advances. But we may at the same time find that people work longer in their careers because they live to a riper age and we can't afford to have a younger generation carry the burden of their retirement for, for decades. We may see that trend. Uh, we may see a reduction in the number of hours uh, that uh, we work in, in, in a week in an average company. We may find adjustments of this kind. But at the end of the day, the advance of technology ought to enable us to create greater prosperity, and I have faith that that will happen. At, at the onset of the Industrial Revolution, um, uh, we had uh, the Luddites uh, in, in, in Britain who went around wrecking machines uh, because machines were depriving them of the manual jobs they had had. Um, and yet, we've moved a long way from the steam engine and we've continued to find full employment uh, for our, uh, the majority, at least, of our population. But I think I, I'd like to make an additional comment. The tech revolution to which you've been referring is similar in my way of thinking to the impact revolution. It's brought by younger people. They create new business models like Tesla, not that Elon Musk was that young when, when he, he started to get uh, involved in, in uh, running it. They create new business models, which create more valuable companies. They overtake the incumbent leaders. 
in the same way that Microsoft and Apple overtook IBM, which had been around for a hundred years. And they create growth and prosperity in the process of this, of this disruption. So we need to adjust to changing technology, but we have the ingenuity and the capacity uh, to develop new industries that absorb this, uh, this unemployment and create opportunities uh, for people to have increasingly um, uh, favorable uh, livelihoods and living conditions. That would be an optimistic and I certainly hope perspective. And there has been adaptations through various and in other industrial revolutions in the past. I'm a little bit more concerned about some of the bigger picture issues. And you hinted at it, uh, the bifurcation of the haves and have nots. They each have equal voting power. In theory, the have nots will likely, they don't, <laughs> but they should win every political election because there's gonna be more of them than there are quote unquote people in the top 1,000th of 1%. Henceforth, yeah. politics, coupled with higher taxation, effectively to some degree, as I would call it, socialism of the redistribution of wealth is almost gonna be inevitable as we're seeing things unfold with social unrest. One of my members, a billion dollar family, and I know some of my people on the line have heard me share this already, has basically said they thought the idea of chaos in the US was like 0 0.001, but since COVID, coupled with the unrest, they're putting it at like three to 5%, which I know is still relatively small. Uh, and even that may be exaggerated per their mindset, I understand that, but we're seeing uprisings in Seattle and Portland. And then we have an election upcoming and I could paint a picture from both perspectives. If President Trump wins, he'll probably fight raising taxes, but there'll be more uprisings, but, if Joe Biden wins, it's inevitable that we're going to have much more regulation and higher taxes. I don't, it, it puts all of us Americans in a tough decision. Well, Angela, I think we have to accept that during the last 25 years, we have seen hugely increased returns to capital relative to returns to labor. I was lucky enough to be in the financial industry as a venture capitalist and a private equity investor to benefit from the availability of cheap money uh, for decades uh, and to be in an industry where remuneration levels because of the huge profits that were uh, being made arose to untold heights never seen before. At the same time, the majority of the population has seen its wage or salary level stagnant in real terms for 25 years. If you look at uh, the article in uh, yesterday's New York Times by my Professor Michael Sandel, he points out that only 30% of the population of the United States has a four-year university degree. But if you look in Congress, 98% of the members of Congress have four-year degrees. And so the populism that we see today fueling a lot of movements politically, the anti-elitism which is characterizing um, the policies of, uh, of, of governments across the world is coming from a real imbalance. But no amount of redistribution of wealth and income can close these gaps in inequality. To do that, you have to bring investment and business to contribute to bringing these solutions. You have to push diversity within companies, not just by talking about it, but by measuring it and by making comparisons and by showing that improved diversity results in greater profitability for these companies. 
And there's quite a lot of evidence that that is the case. And so once again, you come to the conclusion that the reason you feel we're at an impasse with no attractive alternatives before us is you're doing so between a system that perpetuates the current problems, digs a deeper and deeper hole for ourselves, socially and environmentally. Now, if we want to avoid rebellion, the system has to appear fair. We cannot continue for another 25 years to make massive profits on capital and people seeing their wages and their standard of living uh, frozen, unable to go on the holidays that they got used to taking or paying for you know, the furnishings of their kids' home or, or whatever, of whatever else. And so I believe we have to change the system. And my book, Impact, unlike previous uh, attempts at looking at, at, at these issues, actually puts forward a solution. The solution is technology enables us to measure the impact of companies. We have a right to know that impact, and we already have a third to a half of all the investment going to improving the environment and society. Let's bring that transparency to these huge investment flows and we will see our companies change their behavior away from polluting and creating social issues in the search for profit to focusing on delivering both profit and this improvement. I'd like to turn the attention a little bit, but this does relate to what you just said with the amazing work that you've done with the Portland Trust, a non-for-profit, uh, really action-based think tank related to a lot of the issues, trials and tribulations and struggles we have with our fellow human beings. If you could describe what the Portland Trust is and your involvement in it. So uh, when I decided to leave Apex Partners, the venture capital and then private equity firm, which I co-founded, I wanted to, at the age of 60, I left it in 2005, 15 years ago, I wanted to deal with two issues. I felt I could devote 20 years to two issues. One was the social inequality, the poverty uh, that we've just been talking about. The other one is the Middle East conflict. Uh, I started out as, uh, as an Egyptian. I was born in Egypt, a Jewish family living in Egypt. We were kicked out and left Egypt as refugees after the Suez Crisis. We left in 1957. I was just uh, over 11 years old. We moved to the UK. The UK welcomed me and I went to a public school, meaning by that a state school, and I was lucky enough to get into Oxford University and the state paid for my education. I then got a scholarship to go to Harvard Business School. I ended up, uh, after a couple of marriages, marrying a wonderful Israeli woman, uh, Sharon Harrell, who is a film producer, whose father had been the commander of the Exodus, the Holocaust uh, survivors uh, ship that had brought immigrants uh, from Europe after the Second World War uh, to what became Israel. And so I felt that my life had given me the opportunity to straddle this conflict and the resources to be able to try to do something good about it. So we have offices in, in London, in Tel Aviv, and in Ramallah on the West Bank. And we work to, as you said, we're an action tank, not a think tank. We work to improve the standard of living uh, on the Palestinian side by boosting the Palestinian economy 
and we tackle social issues on the Israeli side, issues of populations that are left behind, orthodox religious Jews, Arabs, or Druze communities, Bedouin communities, and others, using the tools of impact investment. And for those, and I highly recommend, again, uh, Sir Ronald's tremendous book, Impact Reshaping Capitalism to Drive Real Change. We have generational family members live on now, single family office executives. What would they, what knowledge and action steps would they get from reading the book and how could they become impactful? So the first thing is all of us are consumers and we can consume differently. We can become more aware with all this uh, transparency that is now coming to the impacts of companies of which companies' products we purchase. And then many of us have pension plans. Many of us who work in big companies have no idea how our pension plans are being invested. Let's focus on how they're being invested. Let's ask the pension fund managers of our pension plans, what are you doing about ESG investment and impact investment? Again, the distinction between the two uh, being that impact investment measures the actual impact of the companies in which you, uh, you invest. And then as investors today, I would make allocations I would first of all say that 10% uh, of my portfolio should go to achieve market rates of returns within the field of impact investment, impact venture capital, impact private equity, impact real estate, impact infrastructure, and so on. And then on the other side of my portfolio, I would invest only in ESG stocks. What are those? These are the stocks of companies that avoid polluting as much and avoid the use of child labor and other uh, antisocial um, uh, behavior. And over time, I would invest in those companies that achieve the best combination of profit and impact. I believe those companies will attract the best talent, will grow the fastest, and will become the most profitable investments. So it doesn't involve a trade-off in the way that we've traditionally thought uh, that if you do good and do well, somehow you will do less well. And then as philanthropists, which many of you are, use your philanthropy to support this impact movement to support the companies which are providing employment to people of, of color, to other marginalized uh, communities, to companies that are delivering products that are providing clean energy and so on. In short, run your financial affairs according to risk, return and impact. And Sir Ronald Cohen, for those that want to, and I, again, highly recommend purchasing the book. I got the hard copy, I guess you could say, and the Kindle edition on Amazon. And again, it was fantastic. And I really, really enjoyed it. For those that want to take that next step and learn more about how they could be impactful in the world of ESG and impact and some of the bigger societal issues that you're noting. Now, they may have a foundation or have other ways that they go about taking action steps, but if they don't, how could they learn more from you, uh, whether through the Portland Trust or other websites or connectivity that you could recommend now to them? Well, please, uh, Angela, feel free to give them my email. I can't guarantee I'll be able to answer it directly, but somebody in my office will be very happy to help you. Uh, yes, well, that will be very helpful. That's all good. Well, everyone, we're just about an hour in. We're heading to the end. I, one, wanted to thank his time is very valuable, Sir Ronald Cohen, for his gracious time today and answering my questions and listening to one or two of my rants. <laughs> now you know what Jeremy Grantham and others had to go through, uh, but they taught me much more 
than I certainly taught them. So I greatly appreciate that. Everyone, I'm Angelo Robles. I'm the host of the Angelo Robles podcast and founder and CEO at Family Office Association, a global membership organization dedicated to families of wealth, resources, and their family office executives. We do a tremendous amount of original proprietary content, a variety of master classes on creating a family office and adapting and being anti-fragile in today's complex and very challenging world. And we host a variety of programs, digital, often daily. So we're an incredibly interactive group. You can reach me through social media, YouTube is family office. We do a fair amount of our videos on there, but really be an interactive as a member, which you could learn more about at familyofficeassociation.com. And my email is angelo at familyofficeassociation.com. Thank you all for being on today. And Sir Ronald, a special thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Angela. Thank you.